Good morning, everyone. Can I give you a very warm uh, welcome to our service here at Deeside Christian Fellowship Church, whether you're here with us in the building or you are watching online. You're very welcome. Uh, let's just open the service with a, a short prayer. Dear Lord and loving Heavenly Father, we give you thanks that we can gather together to sing our praise and hear your word being preached. May you stir us to praise and give us attentive minds to hear your word during this service. Dear Lord, whether we are in the church building or watching online currently, may the presence of your spirit be felt in us. We give you thanks for all that have given of their time and energy to make this service possible and we ask for your blessing to be upon them. And may you bless us through this service and the power of your word being preached, bring a harvest in the lives of all who hear it. Amen. I just have one announcement at this stage. Um, it's with great sadness that I have to announce the passing of Joe Paiaia, who passed away last Sunday evening. Joe was a friend of the fellowship for many, many years, and he leaves behind him his wife Gigi, his son Ara, his daughter-in-law Raquel, and granddaughter Ariane. Please remember Gigi and the family in your prayers at this time. We're going to um, have our first hymn. The band will lead us in that. It is crown him with many crowns. And then after that, I'll come back with some further information.
So our um, next item is actually the children's spot, and many of you will know, uh, and maybe you can show me by raising your hand if you were at Holiday Bible Club last week. Anybody? Can I hear a yay for Holiday Bible Club? Yay! yay. I'm not sure how that's coming through online, but it's very enthusiastic in the church. <laughs> um, I have on good authority from one of the leaders that it was a great week, so I hope the kids all enjoyed it. And um, there's still a week of school holidays, at least here in Scotland. So if you want, uh, and you've got school-age kids, there is um, fusion football coming up this week, and it's going to be even better than Holiday Bible Club, I think, if that's possible. But we're away to see a, a video from Holiday Bible Club, and it's a little bit of a mystery to me, so I haven't seen it yet. And if there's an action song included in it, I'm expecting you all to stand and do the actions. Anyway, let's play the video. It does look as if there was a lot of fun had last week. And as I say, Fusion Football's on this week. So if you haven't signed up already, uh, you can contact the church office. But it starts on Monday, it starts tomorrow. Uh, we'll have a reading now. Uh, if you'd like to turn with me to Exodus chapter 12. We're reading from verse 43. through to chapter 13, verse 16. So Exodus chapter 12, verse 43. And the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, this is the statute of the Passover. No foreigner shall eat of it, but every slave that is bought for money may eat of it after you have circumcised him. No foreigner or hired servant may eat of it, it shall be eaten in one house. You shall not take any of the flesh outside the house, and you shall not break any of its bones. All the congregation of Israel shall keep it. If a stranger 
shall sojourn with you and would keep the Passover of the Lord, let all his males be circumcised. Then he may come near and keep it. He shall be as a native of the land, but no uncircumcised person shall eat of it. There shall be one law for the native and for the stranger who sojourns among you. All the people of Israel did just as the Lord commanded Moses and Aaron. And on that very day, the Lord brought the people of Israel out of the land of Egypt by their hosts. The Lord said to Moses, consecrate me, so consecrate to me all of the firstborn. Whatever is the first to open the womb among the people of Israel, both man and of beast is mine. Then Moses said to the people, remember this day in which you came out from Egypt, out of the house of slavery, for by a strong hand, the Lord brought you out from this place. No leavened bread shall be eaten. Today in the month of Abib, you are going out. And when the Lord brings you into the land of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites, which he swore to your fathers to give to you, a land flowing with milk and honey, you shall keep this service in this month. For seven days you shall eat unleavened bread, and on the seventh day there shall be a feast to the Lord. Unleavened bread shall be eaten for seven days. No leavened bread shall be seen with you, and no leaven shall be seen with you in all your territory. You shall tell your son on that day, it is because of what the Lord did for me when I came out of Egypt, and it shall be to you as a sign on your hand and as a memorial between your eyes, that the law of the Lord may be in your mouth. For with a strong hand, the Lord has brought you out of Egypt. You shall therefore keep this statute at its appointed time from year to year. When the Lord brings you into the land of the Canaanites, as he swore to you and your fathers, and shall give it to you, you shall set apart to the Lord all the first that opens the womb, all the firstborn of your animals that are male shall be the Lord's. Every firstborn of a donkey you shall redeem with a lamb, or if you do not redeem it, you shall break its neck. Every firstborn of the man among you, so, sorry, every firstborn of man among you, you shall redeem. And when in time to come your son asks you, what does this mean? You shall say to him, by a strong hand, the Lord brought us out of Egypt from the house of slavery. For when Pharaoh stubbornly refused to let us go, the Lord killed all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both the firstborn of man and the firstborn of animals. Therefore, I sacrifice to the Lord all the males that first opened the womb. But all the firstborn of my sons I redeem. It shall be as a mark on your hand or frontlets between your eyes. For by a strong hand, the Lord brought us out of Egypt. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. We'll now just have a time of prayer. Dear Lord and loving Heavenly Father, we give you thanks and praise that we can call out to you through prayer. And we know that you are a powerful and compassionate God who hears our prayers and answers them. Dear Lord, we mourn the passing of Joe Paiaia. And we lift Gigi, Ara, Raquel and Ariane before you. May they know your loving comfort at this painful time. May you restore them and protect them as they grieve the loss of Joe. Dear Lord, you are a God of compassion, and because of that, we can pray for all we who we know that are unwell or suffering at this time. I will pause for a few seconds and ask that everyone in the church and at home that are watching online, silently bring those that are in need of prayer before you now. Yeah. 
Dear Lord, we give you thanks for all who participate, participated in the Holiday Bible Club last week. We lift the young folk who attended before you and humbly ask that the Bible verses that they heard and learned, the Bible stories that were discussed, would guide them to Jesus. And we give you thanks in advance for all who will attend Fusion Football next week, both the participants and the coaches. May you bless that activity and may you be at work in the hearts of all who attend. Dear Lord, we give you thanks that the restrictions related to COVID-19 continue to be pulled back and that we will have further opportunities to meet together in the days and weeks ahead. We ask that as we begin to meet together, your spirit would be with us. Dear Lord, may we be like the two men from Emmaus that we read of in John's Gospel, who were walking with Jesus, and after they recognized him, said, did not our hearts burn within us while he talked to us on the road, while he opened us the scriptures? May it be like that for us as we begin to meet together in smaller groups and discuss the scriptures. We lift the leaders of our nation before you and pray that you would be near them and guide them so that they would make informed and wise decisions for the nation. And here in the church, dear Lord, we ask that you would bring a blessing on all who are about to leave for junior church. We pray for all the young folk and for the leaders there, dear Lord. May your blessing be upon them. And we think also of the community around us, dear Lord. May we be a good witness to them. And may there be a willingness to engage both with the community and with the church, dear Lord so that the gospel, your good news, would be known in this area. And we lift David before you as well, dear Lord, as he preaches later in the service. We do just pray that your blessing would be upon him, that he would bring the words to us that you've set upon his heart. We pray that we would have open and attentive ears to hear, dear Lord. I pray for all this in your son's name. Amen. So we're going to sing again, O Great God. Uh, and then during that song, I will indicate when the kids should leave for junior church. And then after the end of the song, David will come and give the sermon.
Well, good morning. Good morning. It's uh, good to see you all this morning and to welcome those who are joining us online as well. Hopefully the live stream will hold up a bit better than it did uh, a few weeks ago. If you have kept up with developments, you'll know that this past week the Scottish Government uh, has relaxed social distancing requirements from tomorrow. Uh, so tomorrow we'll see the end of uh, the capacity of the church being limited by the Scottish Government. So from next week, you'll be able to choose your own seats. I'm, I'm, I'm glad there was that response from Campbell, because uh, I was going to say for the last few months you've had me to thank for where you've been sitting, um, but I can tell you it'll be a, I'll gladly relinquish that responsibility. Um, it's good that the capacity of the church will be going back to normal. Um, that's something we should certainly thank God for after the last 17 months. Um, it's good to have some visitors here this morning. And it's good also to welcome some back uh, for the first time since last March. Um, but there are many who haven't yet returned or returned on a regular basis. Um, and I'm obviously speaking primarily this morning to those that are watching online. It's really important to gather with, God, with God's people, our brothers and sisters, fellow members of the body, to worship him, to hear his word and to encourage each other. If you haven't yet returned, can I suggest that next Sunday would be a good time to do so? And I would encourage you to come back. We miss you and the body is incomplete without you. It's also good that home groups will be able to resume the week after next without the need for Zoom. Um, and let's make use of those freedoms to meet uh, in, in our homes that we haven't had for so long. But a challenge may be, let, let's not try and return to normal and have that as our goal, um, but to press the reset button and ask God afresh how he would wish us to use our homes for his glory. The Scottish Government has been in control of our homes for the last 17 months. Let's not wrestle control back into our own hands uh, but place our homes in God's hands uh, and show hospitality like never before. Well, whether here or online, if you have a Bible, if you could turn to the passage that uh, Robert read, Exodus 12 and 13. We're continuing our studies in the book of Exodus, and last week Pharaoh finally let the captive people of Israel go. It took 10 plagues, but after the last plague, he couldn't wait to get rid of the people. The firstborn of every household and all the livestock died on one night throughout the whole of Egypt. No one escaped from Pharaoh's palace to the criminals in prison. But the people of Israel were miraculously saved by the blood of the Passover lamb. So as we turn to our passage this morning, let's pray. Father in heaven, we come before you this morning to worship you, the living God, the God who saves, the God who meets us at the point of our greatest need. We thank you for your goodness, mercy, and grace towards us. We pray that you would continue to speak to us this morning through your word. Make us attentive and receptive. And we pray that you'll challenge us and change us, conforming us more and more to the image of your son. And if there are any here this morning who've yet to bow the knee to Jesus, we pray that you would open their eyes to see their bondage to sin, their need of redemption and the wonderful salvation and new life in Christ offered at the cross and received by faith. These things we pray in our Saviour's name. Amen. Well, I think everyone here, uh, above the age of three anyway, has at least one date etched on their memory. Probably at least two. Some of us, of course, will have many more. Uh, especially those uh, with a quiverful. 
We often set aside these dates each year to celebrate and remember. Birthdays, wedding anniversaries, Christmas, Easter. These days often include a meal, cards, presents, a cake, maybe even candles. But failure to remember these dates can have significant consequences. Some dates are important to just a few people. Others have national or even international significance. If I was to say, remember, remember the... There's a few people who could finish that sentence. Remember, remember the 5th of November, gunpowder, treason and plot. I know of no reason why the gunpowder treason should ever be forgot. Well, a lot of people actually have forgotten about the gunpowder plot. A few years back, I had to explain to a group of 20 Norwegians what bonfire night was all about. They'd come to Aberdeen on a, a whiskey, I mean a shopping, no, I mean a professional development exchange. <laughs> and they were here on the 5th of November. And with bonfires and fireworks, that could have been very confusing for them. But Bonfire Night is an example of a celebration that has probably sadly lost its significance in the mind of many in the UK, even though it's still widely celebrated. Well, the events of the night of 14th of Abib were just such a night for the Jews. John's Gospel even calls it the Feast of the Jews. The events of the Passover were massive. They defined the nation and its identity. As we saw last week, the people of Israel reached a climatic and defining moment in their history in the middle of chapter 12 of Exodus. Yahweh had made various promises to Abraham, Isaac and Jacob many centuries back, but their descendants found themselves in slavery in Egypt for 400 years. The most powerful civilization in the known world Humanly speaking, there was no way of escape, no hope. The people were trapped in a cycle of captivity. But, as Andy highlighted last week, God is faithful. He had promised Abraham that he would have descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky, that he would make them into a great nation, that he would rescue his descendants from Egypt and give them a new land, and that they would be a blessing to the nations, and God was faithful. So we saw in earlier in Exodus that God chose Moses to lead his people, yet it was clear that it wasn't Moses that was in control here. It wasn't the power of Moses that was being shown to the nations. It was the strong arm of the Lord. Nine plagues had befallen the land of Egypt, demonstrating the superiority the massive superiority of Yahweh over Pharaoh and the other gods of the Egyptians. But Pharaoh's heart was hard, and he would not let the people of Israel go. Serving God and serving Pharaoh were incompatible, and Pharaoh knew it. He was de determined he would not let the people go. But it was at this point that the tenth plague came, the death of the firstborn, both man and livestock. In the middle of the night, Pharaoh commanded the people to leave. Just go, he says. So they did, carrying with them the spoil of Egypt. In two weeks' time, we'll get to another significant and defining event in the history of the people of Israel, the crossing of the Red Sea. But the author of Exodus seems to pause between these two events. I'm sure if I was writing the book of Exodus, I would have wanted to roll them up into one event and make a really big thing of it. But the book of Exodus doesn't do that, and this should catch our attention. The events of 14th of Abib are so great, so significant, so defining, that God wants us to pause. On the surface, God gives the people of Israel three ongoing ceremonies feasts or sacrifices in this passage. But looking at this passage as a whole, we actually see five things that God wants us to remember. Five things that God wants us 
to be impressed on our hearts. As the people of Israel were three and a half thousand years ago, he still wants to impress them on our hearts this morning. So we'll move through these uh, quite rapidly this morning. So firstly, we see that we need to remember that it was the strong hand of the Lord who rescued his people from slavery. It was the strong hand of the Lord. This is repeated three times in our passage. In chapter 12, 51, on that very day, the Lord brought the people of Israel out of the land of Egypt. 13, verse 3, for by a strong hand, the Lord brought you out of this place. And 13, 9, for with a strong hand, the Lord has brought you out of Egypt. It was Yahweh, the Lord, who brought them out of Egypt. It wasn't Moses, it was the Lord. It was his strong hand that rescued and saved them. It was the Lord who should receive all of the praise. How often we fail to praise God for his salvation as we should. I don't know what your heart was doing while we were singing the hymns that we've already sung so far this morning. Crown him with many crowns, the lamb upon the throne. O great God in highest heaven. Was your heart going out to the God of your salvation? Were you praising him as you should? How often we forget to thank him. How often our hearts actually tend towards criticizing. The rest of the book of Exodus shows us just how quickly the people of Israel failed to remember the God who had saved them. And aren't we so often the, the same? Don't we need to turn to God again and confess that we haven't given him the honor and the praise that is due to him for all that he has done? So firstly, we can see from our passage that we need to remember that rescue from bondage and slavery is the work of the Lord by a mighty demonstration of his power. And our response should be to praise him. But secondly, we need to remember that it is our responsibility to pass the good news of God's salvation on to future generations. It's our responsibility to pass it on. Did you notice that? The first reference to this was actually in last week's reading in relation to the Passover, but the other two were in today's text. At least part of the role of the three religious ceremonies stipulated here was for the people of Israel to accurately pass on the meaning, not just the forms of the ceremonies to the next generation. It's very easy to celebrate a hollowed out tradition without any meaning. This passage warns us about that. Look at 13 verse 8. You shall tell your sons on that day, it's because of what the Lord did for me when I came out of Egypt. And at 13 verse 14, and when in time to come your son asks you, what does this mean? You shall say to him, by a strong hand the Lord brought us out of Egypt from the house of slavery. For when Pharaoh stubbornly refused to let us go, the Lord killed all the firstborn in the land of Egypt. And then if you just turn back a couple of verses, uh, chapter 12, verse 26 from last week's reading. And when the children say to you, what do you mean by this service? You shall say, it's the sacrifice of the Lord's Passover. For he passed over the houses of the people of Israel in Egypt when he struck the Egyptians, but spared our houses. Three times we're reminded to give God the glory, and three times we're reminded to pass it on to future generations. I wonder whether you caught the American 4x100 relay team at the Olympics this past week. Uh, apologies to any Americans here this morning. Um, a clown show, ridiculous, a total embarrassment shambolic, completely unacceptable. And those were the views of Carl Lewis and Michael Johnson as the USA team failed to qualify for the finals. Two renowned American sprinters who were throwing abuse at their compatriots. 
What went wrong? Well, everything, it seems. They'd completely missed the point of what they were trying to do. They were all sprinters, and it seems as though they went to try and sprint as fast as they could, but completely forgot they were supposed to be passing the baton one to another. And it was how quickly the baton got round the track rather than them. It can all go wrong if we don't prioritise the passing of the baton to future generations. Yes, God is good, God is gracious, God is faithful. And as we've already seen, it's God who saves and rescues, not us. But God has given responsibility to us that we need to take seriously as families, primarily fathers, as well as a church. But not limited to that, grandparents, aunties and uncles, everyone has a role to play. And yes, it's always a challenge. But it's wonderful to see that God specifically gave the people of Israel these three acts of remembrance to remind them and help them pass the good news on to future generations. You probably saw from the, the pictures that we saw earlier, uh, it was really good to see the car park fooled with so many joyous children this last week, as well as some joyous junior and senior leaders as well. It was a wonderful opportunity to pass the good news of Jesus on to the next generation. But what will happen in your household this afternoon or when your grandchildren come over to visit? Young people are naturally inquisitive. Teenagers may be less so, at least verbally, but we need to strike while the iron is hot. Junior church and holiday Bible club must surely be seen as the icing on the cake and not expect others to do the job for us. But we have each other, we have resources, but we need to take the opportunities that we have. Children grow so fast. My eldest is in the final year of school and will be leaving home potentially in 12 months time. Um, it seems only a few short years ago she was uh, cradled in my arms new from, from the hospital. Time is short. Let's take the opportunity that we have to pass the good news on of God's wonderful salvation that he's provided for us. This is a theme picked up elsewhere in the Bible. Psalm 8, 78 reminds us, Give ear, O my people, to my teaching. Incline your ears to the words of my mouth. I will open my mouth in a parable and I'll utter dark things from of old, things that have been heard and known that our fathers have told us. We will not hide them from their children, but tell to the coming generation the glorious deeds of the Lord and his might and the wonders that he has done. Let's make sure as a family, and as individual families within the corporate gathering of the church, that we prioritize the passing on of the good news of the Lord Jesus Christ. So God has set out five elements of how the people of Israel should remember what happened that night. Two annual memorials and one sacrifice. We are to remember firstly that it's the strong hand of the Lord who rescues his people and give him praise for that. And secondly, that it's our responsibility to pass on that good news to future generations. But thirdly, we need to remember that the plan of God for salvation was always open. It was never exclusive, but it was conditional. We see this in chapter 12, verse 43 to verse 50, relating to the Passover. The Passover ceremony obviously has rich symbolism and stands at the centerpiece of these commemorations. The New Testament makes it clear that the Passover points clearly to Jesus as its fulfillment. Jesus was the Passover lamb, the perfect spotless lamb who died in his prime as a perfect atoning 
substitutionary sacrifice. But this passage before us this morning points to a particular aspect of those Passover celebrations. In the Exodus, the Passover lamb was shed for the people of Israel. But after the plague, it's important that boundaries were set to those who could receive it. It wasn't something that could only be taken by ethnically pure children of Abraham. But it wasn't something to be taken lightly either. Did you notice that as you read through the passage? Verse 43 looks fairly black and white. This is the statute of the Passover. No foreigner shall eat of it. But the passage goes on to list a few exceptions. Slaves can eat of the Passover, for example, if they're brought into the, into the household of the people of Israel. And strangers who sojourn with you, verse 48. Verse 47 says, all the congregation of Israel shall keep the Passover. Failure to keep the Passover had consequences. I think what Moses is saying here is that the Passover meal is really important. Only those who've thrown their lot in with God's covenant people could eat it. It's like you would need to apply for citizenship in the new community. Not in a casual way, but all in. They had to live under God's covenant and bear the sign of the covenant in their males being circumcised. God's plan of salvation was never tied exclusively to a specific Semitic racial group. But living under the covenant means having a new identity. If anyone wanted to take the Passover, their identity had to be subsumed with the people of God. They had to identify with them. It had to be their defining identity. What should our response to this be? Well, thanks be to God. I don't know about you, but I'm not Jewish, but still a child of Abraham through the atoning work of Jesus. The way to God is open. God has made a way. God has made a way in the atoning sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ, our Passover lamb. In the New Testament, uh, baptism is the uh, equivalent, if you like, of a covenant sign for entry into the kingdom. And that's the sign that we use today rather than circumcision. But God wants a people. He wants a people for his own possession. And coming under that covenant means throwing our identity in with Jesus so we've seen that we are to remember firstly that this is the strong hand of the Lord that rescued his people. Secondly, it's our responsibility to pass that good news on to future generations. And thirdly, that God's plan of salvation was always open to all who would throw their lot in with God's people that would come under his rule. But fourthly, we also see that the plan of salvation was always about more than freedom from slavery. And we see that in chapter 13, verses 1 and 2, and then 11 to 16. Um, I don't know whether as you read it you noticed that, but there are three things being talked about. The Passover, the consecration of the firstborn, and the Feast of Unleavened Bread. But it kind of mixes them up a bit which makes it a bit confusing. But verses 3, sorry, 11 to 16, uh, follow on from verses 1 and 2. There is no distinction made between the Egyptians and the Israelite people in the 10th plague. And that's different from the previous nine plagues. There was something different going on, and it should make us sit up and notice. Slavery in Egypt wasn't the people's biggest problem. They thought it was their biggest problem, but it wasn't. And God makes that clear in the way he rescued them. Slavery in Egypt was a picture of their biggest problem. 
and it's a picture of our biggest problem too. The people of Israel, just as the people of Egypt, were children of Adam. They were sinners and they were deserving of God's judgment. Rescue from slavery and their enemies was important, but actually the people of Israel needed to be rescued from death, the consequences of their own actions. And to understand the cross properly, we need to understand the Old Testament and the book of Exodus in particular. Now don't mishear me this morning, particularly in the current cultural context. I'm not saying that slavery isn't horrendous. After all, it was William Wilberforce and the other evangelical Christians of the Clapham sect in the 18th and early 19th century that eventually saw the abolition of slavery in 1833 in Great Britain and its empire. But what I am saying is that while we might not know it, or indeed want to accept it, by nature, we are in an even worse position than the people of Israel in Egypt. We are slaves, slaves to a power which is far superior to us. We're in a cycle of slavery that we can't get out of. And it's only the mighty, powerful, saving hand of God that enables us to be free. It's that hand of God which is sovereign over salvation. We need to thank God this morning that he has come, that his Passover lamb has shed his blood, that we can be free. Though many, there are many of us here who will believe in the Lord Jesus Christ this morning, who will know him as their saviour. And there may be some that don't. We need to have shedding, uh, showing the good news of the Lord Jesus Christ as a priority in our lives, demonstrating his kingdom by the way that we live and passing that good news on in the words that we say. So, we're to remember firstly that it's the strong hand of the Lord who rescues his people. Secondly, it's our responsibility to pass that good news on to future generations. Thirdly, that the good news is about more. It wasn't exclusive, but it was open to all. That it was about more than just freedom from slavery. It was about salvation from our greatest enemy, the power of the evil one and our own sinfulness. But finally, the plan of God for salvation was also about a new life of moral purity. It'll be a few months before we get to Exodus 20 on Sunday mornings, probably after the October holidays, but right at this point of the Exodus, God is telling his people that there is a radical break between life in Egypt and life under God's rule. I don't know how much you know about yeast. Yeast is a single-celled microorganism which is everywhere around us. If I put down a tree and left it there for a day, you would find yeast on the tray by the end of the day. We all make use of yeast in many ways, but yeast that gets out of control can do horrendous things. I wonder whether you remember the story of Lot in Genesis. The angel had called him to leave Sodom and Gomorrah and told them not to look back. They weren't to hanker for the life that they'd left behind. But Lot's wife turned back. God is saying in the, in the Feast of the Unleavened Bread, not to turn back. Don't be tempted to turn back. 
Sometimes we can look at the past with rose-tinted glasses, but don't look back. Michael Morales has helpfully said that the Exodus path to abundant life with God is not accomplished with the momentary crossing of a boundary, but can, requires a continual leaving. We are called to forsake the old life of futility, sin and depravity, and to do so with urgency. The people of, Is of Israel often looked back, as we see in the book of Exodus. They looked back on a number of occasions and each time experienced God's displeasure and discipline. And it's easy to criticize them with the space of three and a half thousand years. Why didn't they listen? They'd only just seen God's mighty power in rescuing them from Egypt. Why were they so quick to turn back? And yet we often do the same thing. Going back to patterns of life which don't glorify God and don't put his kingdom first. Putting ourselves first and our own needs and our own wants rather than putting God first and his people. Putting our own pleasure and our own happiness and our own ease before the important task of passing on the baton of God's kingdom, telling others the good news of Jesus. What the prohibition of taking risen dough from Egypt was doing was preventing Egyptian yeast from going with the people out of the land. A clean break from the past was taking place. A new start was required. I expect a number here this morning participated in the sourdough trend during lockdown, or bread making at least, or maybe ginger beer or something stronger. There are many uses of yeast, but yeast reproduces under the right conditions. It can have desirable planned consequences in a loaf of bread, but it can also have undesirable and unplanned consequences, allowing infection to spread. I don't know any, whether anyone's heard of tapache. I tried to make some tapache a few months ago. Tapache is uh, fermented pineapple but the, 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 the skin of the pineapple has natural yeast on it, which allows it to ferment. Um, normally, fermentation is controlled under sanitary conditions and it produces the expected results. Well, I produced this tapache and the yeast was not good yeast and it tasted horrendous. It all went down the bin, down the tubes. Um, it can have undesirable consequences Yeast is a dangerous thing. If we're to fully understand the cross, we need to learn these lessons from Exodus. Many Christians get off on the wrong foot with Jesus because their theology doesn't encompass the Exodus. Life in Egypt must be left behind. If you've got a Bible, could you maybe turn to 1 Corinthians 5? In 1 Corinthians 5, Paul picks up uh, this picture of yeast. 1 Corinthians 5 and verse 7. He says, Cleanse out the old leaven that you may be a new lump, as you really are unleavened. For Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. Let us therefore celebrate the festival, not with the old leaven, the leaven of manis, and evil, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Paul's reminding the people they need to leave behind malice and evil and head towards sincerity and truth. truth. Life in Egypt needed to be left behind <coughs> as they went into the presence and under the rule of God. In the next chapter, 1 Corinthians 6, verse 19, Paul says, you are not your own, you were bought with a price. 
there was a radical change in life that was required. So God is emphasizing in these three festivals that access is open, that it dealt with their biggest problem, which was the problem that resulted from sin rather than just their slavery in Egypt. And that new life in Christ, new life under God's rule, is, got, is what God achieved. And that's what Christ achieved for us on the cross. A new life, not a continuation of the old life. A radical change to come under the rulership of Jesus. Let's praise God this morning. God is a mighty warrior. It's by his mighty strong hand that he rescues his people. There's no way that God's people should have been able to interpret their release from Egypt as anything other than the mighty hand of the Lord. These events were foundational and defining in the life of the people of Israel. God was creating a new people to live under his rule. The Lord's Supper is the defining celebration that we participate in. It's not just about looking back. It's not even just about looking forwards. It's an expression of our participation in these events. Sometimes I wonder whether the Lord's Supper is too secretive. I thought it was refreshing during our services uh, earlier in lockdown when there wasn't an opportunity for children to go to junior church and they were sitting in with us. It should prompt questions. But it's not just children who aren't Christians. They'll be here, some people this morning, who aren't followers of Jesus. And the Lord's Supper should make you question, what is this that's going on? It's absolutely essential that this good news is passed on faithfully to future generations, to our children, to our grandchildren, to all who are far off, because the door is open and the way is open for all who would bow the knee to King Jesus. God has shown his amazing love for us in redeeming us from sin through the death of the Lord Jesus Christ on the cross. Such love demands my soul, my life, my all. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you this morning for the book of Exodus. And we thank you the way that uh, you've shown how you save your people. And we thank you that you've shown us ultimately in the Lord Jesus Christ that he fulfilled that pattern in his life and death on the cross. Father, help us to understand uh, Jesus more as we study the book of Exodus. We thank you, Father, that you are a mighty God, that you've shown your power, your might, and your supremacy over all the gods of this world. That Jesus Christ came into this world, lived a perfect life, and died that we might be forgiven. Help us, Father, to recognize the new life that you have procured for us. Help us not to turn back, to hanker over the past, to think that life before was so much better. Help us, Father, to go forward and to live our lives dedicated to you, living under your rule in this world. We thank you that your kingdom is here and we pray that we might live for your kingdom. 
every aspect of our lives, we pray. Father, we thank you, as we've said, that you are a mighty saviour. We recognise our responsibility to pass the good news of your salvation on to others. Whether that be members of our family or those uh, in the community that don't know you. You want your name to be glorified by all. And Father, we pray that you help us to prioritise that passing of the baton on to future generations. We thank you, Father, that the way of salvation is open. That you have made a way. You've made a way for all who will bow the knee and come under your lordship. We thank you for those here this morning who are living under that rule of Jesus. And we pray for any that aren't, that they might come to know him in the days ahead. That you'll show them Jesus and that they might too bow the knee in submission to him. Father, we thank you that you dealt with our greatest need. That you reminded your people through the consecration of the firstborn that you had dealt with sin. And we thank you for the reminder that new life in Christ is what we are called to, to leave Egypt, to leave the practices of Egypt and to live under your kingdom, under the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, if we are uh, followers of Jesus, but are expressing reluctance in our lives to be wholehearted followers, to be wholehearted disciples, forgive us, we pray. And by your grace, may we turn afresh and live under his authority in our lives. So Father, we thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you for his atoning death on the cross as our Passover lamb. And as we go from this place this morning, we pray that you'll help us to live lives that bring glory to you. Not turning to the leaven of Egypt of malice and evil, but living under your glorious kingdom of sincerity and peace and truth. We ask these things for Jesus' sake. Amen. We will stand to sing our final hymn, Our God Saves. Jesus is King and demands my soul, my life, and my all. Let's stand and sing our closing hymn together when I survey the wondrous cross. <laughs>